All right, everybody, it's good to see you. I hope you've had a good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad you've come back for this evening service, evening uh, activities. I'm looking forward to what we've got planned tonight. Uh, just a couple, couple of words, and then Kyle's going to lead a couple songs. I'll share a brief devotional. We won't be this part, but it won't last more than uh, five, ten minutes or so. And then at that point, when we finish up in here with a prayer, We'll take a short break, and we've got a really good Faith in Action event planned for you downstairs. If you'd like to be a part of that, uh, working on some of these hospitality bags we're going to be giving to these uh, ladies who have recently gotten out of jail, and we're excited we can bless them in that way. And we'll also be writing some uh, cards, or maybe doing one or the other, writing some cards to these ladies to encourage them, put some um, literature about the Hoover Church of Christ and about the Lord in there with them and hope we can encourage them. So that's one thing that we'll be doing. Uh, there will also be a good class going on here in the auditorium. Um, I wish I could do both, to be honest. Uh, Jerry Culbertson is going to be here teaching a class on archaeology in the Bible. And uh, I kind of glanced through uh, Jerry's slides uh, this afternoon when he sent them to me. And, uh, and I think it's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, good, good material. He's got a lot of experience in that area. So you'll be blessed either way you go. If you get on stairs with us. If you stay here with us in the auditorium, it'll be a, it'll be a good evening. So thanks for coming. Uh, we'll have a couple songs. I'm going to share just a brief devotional with you. One, one thing, two things, quickly, exciting news. Uh, we are so thrilled that uh, Emily Blakemore was baptized this afternoon. Uh, we are just so proud of this sweet young lady. I appreciate her and her good family. Uh, Aiden McQuillan was also baptized this afternoon. And we appreciate uh, Aiden and his good family as well. Uh, both of these young people are just encouragement to us, and I'm, I'm just thankful that they're a part of our congregation here. So we appreciate both you guys and your families. Lift for Jesus, so oh my brother is disciple. I want to share a couple words about that theme in that song, since this is our Faith in Action night. Looking forward to a number of these on the first Sunday night for the next few months. And I appreciate uh, those who are being involved and those who will be involved in, in getting them together, um, as well as the teaching that will be done in this room. Um, I w we had some work done at the house this week, and a repairman was there, and inevitably... Um, it seems questions come up about, you know, what do you do, that sort of thing. Told him what I did and asked questions about the church, you know, what, what, what's the church like? And, and, and that's an interesting question. I, I don't know how you'd answer that question. Like, what is, what is your church like? What is, what is your church like, the church where you attend? And my, my response to it was, was pretty simple. I, I, I said, there are a lot of things you know, I can say about our congregation, but, but one thing that always sticks out to me is we have a lot of people who like to do good for people. You know, we, have a, we have a lot of people who like to be involved in doing good. That's a very simple thing, you know. It's, um, I guess, 
way that could be said of any church, you know. But other, but some churches have more of that kind of personality than others, and I think Hoover is one of those places. I hear it from people who come here, I hear it from people in the community, and I'm thankful for that. There are a couple of verses in the Book of Acts. Um, there's one in Acts 10:38 where um, Peter's talking about Jesus, um, and it one of the, the what is verse 38? He says. Uh, he says that he, about Jesus, he went about doing good and healing and so on. God was with him. Acts, when God's with you, you just, you just do good stuff. Uh, but that's what Stephen said, or what Peter said about, about Jesus. Then there's this passage in, in Acts 11, one chapter over, that's describing Barnabas. Remember Barnabas, right? Barnabas was a pretty neat guy. And it says about him, just a very simple expression, it says, he came and saw the grace of God. He was glad. He exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Uh, he was a good man. Jesus went about doing good. Barnabas was a good man. Um, this letter we've been studying quite a bit on Sunday mornings, First Peter, says that Peter writes to a church that was kind of struggling with how do we relate to the, to the world, to, to the secular world, and Peter keeps emphasizing throughout the letter, he says, do good, you know, do good, be, be a blessing to the, to the people around you. And when Peter says that, he says, when you encounter hostility, bless, instead of returning hostility for hostility, but rather return blessing for the hostility that they give you. And he's actually echoing this pretty off-quoted statement in the Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah is talking to the people about, you're going to go into captivity, you're going to be there a long time. What do you need to do while you're there? That was the question. You know, what are we going to be? What, what, what? We're, we're here. We're in this foreign land. What do we need to do? And Jeremiah says, build houses, plant vineyards, have kids, get your kids married, enjoy your grandkids, and bless the city where you are. In other words, you're going to be here for a bit. <laughs> you're... This isn't gonna. This isn't gonna be over by next week. You're, you're gonna be here for a little while, so do good. Bless the city. Bless Babylon. Babylon was a was a wicked place, but bless it anyway. Build houses. Take up residence. Live here. And I think you know faith in action is. You don't need faith in action to 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 do good. Obviously, right? we we got folks, and this is the only time we do good. We're not doing what we need to be doing, right? Because uh, you know we got folks who do good all the time. But uh, this is an opportunity for us to bless the city, uh, to bless the community to bless people and um, I'm thankful that we have a lot of folks who um, have that mindset and so I just wanted to encourage us uh, this this just is an outgrowth of what it means to be a Christian and so if you choose to be a part of it it's a, just a small part of what Christianity looks like when you when you live it out you know so I wanted to encourage you thank you for being here tonight uh, Jerry's class is going to be great we've got a good activity downstairs for you and so I know you'll, you'll be blessed whichever route uh, you go tonight. Uh, do we have any prayer requests? Anything you guys want to share before I pray? We'll be done here. Dania? Locally? Joe Harper. Okay. Friend of Dania's has COVID pneumonia in hospital locally. Yeah, George? Yeah, David Naylor has COVID as well, and his kids do too. Is that right? Yeah, David's kids as well. So we'll pray for pray for David and his kids. Joe Harper. Is he sick? COVID. April Collins' father um, has COVID apparently, and we'll. Um, We'll, we'll check on these folks and see how they're doing. I appreciate that. Anything else? Okay. Well, I'm going to pray, and then after that prayer, if you're going to go to Faith in Action, we'll head downstairs, and um, we'll take just a short break. Uh, if you're going to stay here in the auditorium, it'll just be a, a short break, and then Jerry will get up and start teaching here in just, uh, just a few minutes, okay? Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, thank you so much for blessing us. And uh, because we've been so richly blessed, we thank you that you give us chances to bless others. And we pray we'll be that kind of people. Like Jesus, we'll go about doing good. Like Barnabas, we will be good men and women and uh, just people. That like the people Peter wrote to, we'll bless, we'll, 
will return good, even when, even when the world around us sometimes doesn't think highly of Christianity. We, we pray we'll give them a reason to think otherwise. Uh, bless Jerry as he teaches as well, as he strengthens our faith in Scripture and in the accuracy of the historical record. We thank you for all the, the evidence you give us that you are and that your word is true. We ask all. Well, we we pray for the ones we just mentioned, for uh, David Naylor and for his kids, for Joe Harper, and for April Collins' dad. Uh, all these struggling with COVID and its effects. Please be with them and be with others who are on our care lines. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Me okay? I've got a handout here. If I'm get Steve and some of the other guys, Merv, if you want one, raise your hand. If you don't, that's fine too. It's not anything exciting other than the uh, periods of time Neolithic, Calcolithic, Late Bronze, all that good stuff. <clears throat> I do appreciate uh, being asked to uh, teach this class for the uh, next. Uh, five Sundays, first Sunday night of the month, that is, and uh, Lord willing, uh, I will be able to teach um, August and then October, November, December. Uh, if this COVID mess goes away, uh, then uh, my friend Bob Coles, who I went to Israel with for the first time in uh, 1993, again in 1996 and 1999, uh, he and I, on September the 5th, will be in Jerusalem for a couple more days, and then we're going to get on a uh, plane and fly to Athens, and then to Cairo in the middle of the night, and get on a ship the next day and float down the Nile. <laughs> we're going to have a big time. Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing this with Bob and not Kathy, she doesn't like boats to begin with, but uh, it's not going to be a romantic cruise with a, an old guy like me. It'd be better with her. She doesn't like boats, though. Well, one reason is Bob's uh, wife of 50 years died in March. And Bob is a minister at uh, Norwood Congregation in Knoxville, Tennessee, starting his 40th year this year. Knows how to keep a job. I didn't, but anyway. And so when his wife passed away, I said, Bob, let me take you to Israel. He applied for a passport the next day. <laughs> so we are going, hopefully. His passport hadn't come in yet either. He'd be praying about that. It's been in the works since May. So we may have to drive to Atlanta and spend 200 bucks. You can get one in one day over there. Used, used to anyway. But anyway, that's where I'll be. Chuck told me I could pick any topic that I want. And so uh, I figured that a short study of archaeology tied in with the Bible uh, might work well over a uh, four-week uh, period type thing. So here's what I've got in mind. Tonight I want to look at just what is archaeology and explore some of the ins and outs of a dig, uh, maybe talk a little bit about 
biblical archaeology uh, compared to archaeology, if you will. Uh, what uh, should be the relationship between archaeology and the Bible? Maybe a little bit about that. And then uh, in October, uh, look at important biblical sites. If you've got one in mind you want me to look at, I've been to most of them. I look at the archaeology of them, Jerusalem, uh, Bet Shemesh, where I dig, uh, Caesarea Marantima, whatever. We'll look at some of those and talk about the archaeology. And then in uh, November, uh, look at anatomy of the Israelite border town. And that's uh, where I come in uh, for 16 uh, seasons I've excavated at a border town called Tel Bet Shemesh. You look at uh, 1 Samuel and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Tel Bet Shemesh, where the Ark of the Covenant was returned from Philistine captivity uh, to Bet Shemesh and eventually on to Kiryat Karim. But anyway, we'll look at an in-depth study of uh, 8th century Hezekiah and uh, what he did with that border town. He made it a monarchical city, etc., etc. And then on the uh, last December, uh, I want to deal with uh, coherence, and that is uh, archaeology and the Bible. Uh, how do they cohere? And uh, I'll be dealing a lot with a, a dissertation that I finished actually last year, which was entitled uh, The Emergence of Ancient Israel, A Model of Coherence Between Archaeology and the Bible. And what I'll do is uh, look at some places uh, like Shechem, amazing story at Shechem up in Samaria, and talk about uh, how the, they might have been kinfolks. We'll talk about the conquest of Israel, the origin of Israel. Uh, they did not take it by conquest. Joshua is a theological book. He says they took it by conquest, and then judges said they didn't. So you got to look at it from a theological point of view. It wasn't a conquest, I guarantee you. But anyway, we'll talk about all that. Uh, tonight, I want to be... And by the way, if you have any questions, my wife is not up here. She's usually my interpreter. I don't hear well. I talk well, loud, but I don't hear well. So if you ladies have a question, you'll have to send somebody up here to interpret it, because I won't hear you. I have my hearing aids at home. Actually, my hearing aids, when I put them in, I think I can't hear any better. But I can hear TV with it. I love it for TV. So anyway, if you've got a question, I'll try to walk out and hear it or send somebody up here with it, that thing. So tonight I want to uh, talk about uh, uh, what is archaeology. And before we do that, I want to say just a little bit about uh, myself and where I come from. And I think this thing is on, so I hope it is it already on. Hey, yeah, there you go. Um, that's me with a sling stone. You can't see the sling stone. I used to do biblical archaeological seminars, but I only did one in North Carolina, and nobody else wanted me. So we thought it'd be a good item. Dr. Jerry Jones said, you ought to do well with this, and I never got another invitation. So I gave that up. But anyway, that's a picture from that. Uh, I'd been preaching for about 23 years when I ran into this dude. I was at the Harding University lectureship with Bob Coles. We traveled there for years together our annual lectureship, and uh, this was 2000 when I met uh, uh, Dale Manor. Um, Dr. Manor is a uh, uh, professor emeritus at Harding University in uh, Bible and archaeology, and uh, we have a lot of fun on the dig site, and one of the best places to rest is a wheelbarrow. You wouldn't believe it. You can get a good nap in a wheelbarrow. So there he is in a wheelbarrow. And uh, we went to Harding all the time, the lectureships, to uh, learn a little bit, visit with somebody until I ran out of steam, play basketball with Jimmy Allen. Anybody know Jimmy Allen? He died recently. Anyway, he was the best basketball player at 60 years old I've ever met in my life. You just couldn't beat him. But anyway, that's another story. So as we were walking across the, uh, I can't remember the new building he built there in 1965. It was a dorm. I think it was the American Heritage Building. Anybody know that? Any Harding folks in here? Anyway, we were walking across that. They turned it into the president's office, cafeteria. We were walking to the bookstore, and I ran across uh, Dr. Manor had a, an exhibit, and at the top of the exhibit it said, Imagine Your Life in Ruins. Caught my attention. He was manning this, uh, this exhibit, all five foot five inches of him. He's a dynamo. I call him a little mountain goat. He's hard to keep up with him, little old legs. <laughs> He, he, he liked me to kid him, too, about being small. He wouldn't mind. But he, uh, he promptly tried to recruit myself and Bob to come to Israel and dig with him. Well, uh, Bob and I had been to Israel by then three times, so we told him that we have seen Israel already. He said, come to Israel, and I will show you Israel. And I'm sure Bob was thinking what I was thinking. Is this guy, you know, deaf? Did he not hear what we just said? We've been 93, 96, 99. 
What's he going to show me I haven't seen? Long story short, somehow Dale talked me into going with him in 2000 and spent a month digging in Israel. Four long, back-breaking weeks in the hot summer sun of June, getting up at 4.30 in the morning, and if you know me, that's just like a death sentence. I mean, 9 o'clock is too early for me. But I might be up at 4 o'clock studying too, so don't sell me too short. But I don't like to get up early. And uh, we moved in a a 15 by 15 foot square with a pickaxe, rocks, and dirt, and dodged scorpions, and drank hot tea for breaks. I got to liking that though. Hot tea on a hot day is not too bad, really. And uh, it was 90 degrees. And then in the afternoon, when we got through eating, we were worn out, he made us wash pottery for two hours. Whatever you dig up and find, you put it in buckets, you label it, you mark it, you take it in, you wash it, get the mud off, see what you might find. You never know what might come up when you're rubbing on it. And then at night, they had us go to lectures and then went to bed at 8 o'clock and did it all over again. Well, did I mention that we also basically found nothing in that square they put me in, T48? Let's see if this comes up now. There you go. This is what day one looks like on a square in Israel when you're starting at scratch. At least they did provide some shade. My apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. I didn't say anything to you. (laughs) Hush, leave me alone. Sorry about that. And so uh, this is day one, and we're digging. Uh, You can see, I think, probably can't see it so far away, but there's a string line that measured out 15 feet, 15 feet, 15, 5 meter by 5 meter, and uh, that's where we begin. We start going down. And uh, so there's another shot of my, our team, and uh, I had a supervisor who was working on her Ph.D., uh, Tifat Arena, I think's her name now, and uh, she has finished her Ph.D. since then, and she's one of the site supervisors somewhere in Israel. She had grown up with MTV. She knew every song from the 60s. I could start a song, she could finish it. She knew some I didn't even know. She was a sweet little 24-year-old girl and and a nice girl to work for. Here's a shot that uh, we're looking, uh, you're looking due north. That little mountain range out there, it's not really a mountain, 700 or 800 feet high, but that is Zora. And up on that mountain, uh, Samson was born. Then you... uh, turn around and look to the west. That old boy there is named Park Lindstrom. He was a missionary in Connecticut back then. I think he's moved back to Searcy since then. Ty, I can't remember that boy's name. Ty was a young man from Harding. You begin to see we're started down. And if you look uh, just to the... Uh, I, got pointed here. I got one better than that. Hold on here. You look just right here, you can see we're beginning to go down a little bit, probably gone down seven or eight inches maybe, and what will happen is we'll create a wall there. We'll actually create four walls all the way around when we get down, and you call those bulk walls. And those bulk walls, you can read them, stratigraphy, and see what's going on. And once you get down so far, we'll lay down another sandbag there so we can walk on them. But anyway, also we're looking back to the west, and about 25 miles over there is the Mediterranean Sea. This is the beautiful Sorek Valley all around us, and we'll see more of that in a minute. And in that Sorek Valley, you'll see when you're looking to the west, right down in that little valley, uh, at one point, the Ark of the Covenant was brought there. Whew. Give you chill bumps. You're looking to the north, there's Samson. You look down to the west, there's the Ark of the Covenant. It had to be there. Now, in Jerusalem, you can walk in Jerusalem, and they'll say, this is where Jesus walked. You say, no, it ain't. <laughs> 25 feet down, he may have walked. He didn't walk up here, okay? But this is the real deal here. You can't fake the Soric Valley. You're walking where the Ark of the Covenant was. Again, another shot here that's looking uh, uh, basically to the south, excuse me, to the north and the west. And Dr. Manor uh, there is giving us a, a little lecture on what we're doing. And you can see we're beginning to develop a little bit of a bulk wall there. We hadn't moved our line yet because we haven't put our sandbags down yet, but that's what we're doing there. Okay, let's see. And then, just to let you know, <clears throat> this is the end of the dig. Okay? Let me back up. He said they'd go back. Oh, got to point that way. All right. So, this wall right here, see that wall right there? That's it right there. Four weeks later, we went down about four feet, 
and found basically nothing. <laughs> All right, what else I got here? Okay, well, the only thing we did find that was really interesting was this. You imagine an iron sickle blade surviving all that time? It was in there. That's an iron sickle blade from the 8th century B.C. I didn't mention that the Tel Bet Shemesh is an unusual site. It's a seven-acre tell. Tel is a city, a Tel Aviv, a new city. A tell has been built up over time. Uh, we've got about seven or eight layers here. But when you start at Tel Bet Shemesh, when you throw your pickaxe in the ground, you're already in the 8th century B.C. When Sennacherib came in and destroyed Tel Bet Shemesh in 701, 704 B.C., somewhere in there, they didn't rebuild. So when you throw it in the ground, I walk around the ground sometimes, I found an 8th century ground stone just laying on top of the surface. It's an amazing place. So anyway, uh, that's what's going on. We found that sickle blade. One of our guys, Spee Letterman, he's one of our main directors, he said, all right, find the, find the handle. <laughs> wooden handle. You're not going to find a wooden handle 2,800 years later. But anyway, he was very demanding. All right. So, anyway, come to Israel and I'll show you Israel. Dale Manor was right. He showed me Israel. I had not seen Israel. He took me on weekend places where I could climb and the people that I'd gone with in 1993, 1996, no offense to old people because I'm old now. I was younger then. I was taking people to places they could hardly climb on the bus, <laughs> much less climb in Getty. Dale Manor took me to the top of Getty. He took me to the top of a lot of places I hadn't been. He showed me Israel, and I appreciated it. And so uh, I, was, uh, I was kind of hooked because of those weekend jaunts, and I told him, well, I'll come back next year. And I went back in 2001. I did not want to go back to dig. I did not want to go back to get up at 4.30 in the morning. I did not want to go back to throw a pickaxe uh, six or seven hours a day. But I went back anyway because I knew where he'd take me on weekends. And then it happened, 2001. I've got my pickaxe in hand. I'm in, I'm in a, a square. If you can imagine, this is the square that I was in in uh, uh, 2001. We've seen pictures of already. You can imagine I'm standing in it. In 2001, he moved me to another square up there named T-47. This is T-48, T-47, T-46, okay? I'm up in T-47, and we're going down again, and we ain't finding nothing until that one day when I threw that pickaxe in the ground like I was supposed to. I took it down about five inches like that. I pulled it back, flipped it back, and that little baby there flipped right out of the ground. It was broke. Let's see. But this one ain't. That's a beautiful baggy juglet from the 8th century B.C. Can you imagine somebody had their perfume in that? <laughs> Can't smell it, but it's in there. Now, a question I'm always asked, I'll just get it out of the way right now. I bought this downtown. Israel is uh, weird. It's, it's kind of a catch-22. They've got licensed dealers downtown you can go and buy this stuff from but you don't have any providence. I don't know where it came from. But I do know one thing, it is an 8th century piece of pottery exactly like that baggy juglet that I'm holding in my hand. And the reason we buy them is because the guys in Israel don't like us to do it, but they get all this stuff, take it to the university and teach with it. I don't have anything, but I do now. I bring this stuff back and I teach with it. So that's why I buy it. And uh, I'd buy it from a dealer downtown Jerusalem. I don't know where he gets them. I don't really care. Apparently the Israelite uh, government doesn't either. But if I tried to take that thing out on an airplane, they'd throw me under jail. I've got a certificate for this one. I paid good money for it. I can take it home. That's the way that works. I would pass it around. Forget it. <laughs> i got a few things I'll pass around in a minute, but not that. All right, where are we? Okay, uh, one thing I will tell you, I, I learned to appreciate that T-48 back here, 2000, 2001, I'm in T-47, I'm in T-47, and let me tell you right now, I've, I've got, I, I'm an old, old timer, I got a work ethic, these college girls that come over, some boys too, but usually pretty little college girls, they sit on their hiney and dig. You cannot do archaeology on your hind end. So I'm looking back there, I'm in T-47, I'm killing myself with a pickaxe, and I look back there, and there's three of them sitting on their hind end just kind of doing this. 
Oh, my bud boils. Later on, when I, when I finally became a square supervisor, that didn't happen. They either got it and worked or they went somewhere else. It didn't work for me. But here's what I want to tell you about that. Those girls are digging around, and guess what they found? They began to find little slag, iron slag. And before you knew it, they brought some real people in there to work, put a grid in there and began to dig that. It became the largest smith iron shop in all of that part of the world. They never found it. It wasn't for me. I did all that work. I took that thing down four feet, me and my team. So I learned appreciation. I may not be finding anything now, but who knows what's going to come later. That smith shop is as much mine as it is anybody. Does that make sense? So I was hooked, and uh, I've been back uh, 14 out of the last 16 years on that deal, and so uh, that's what it is. Uh, one other thing, uh, my specialty is pickaxe. I know I'm a, well, I was 52 when I started. I'm 73 now, but last time I dug was 2019. I can pickaxe all day long. These kids wear themselves out because they pickaxe like this. Whoo, whoo, whoo. <laughs> I try to show them, but they won't listen. Set your feet, take your axe, bring it up, bend your leg, hit it, pull up. You can do it all day long if you're in any kind of shape at all. I was doing that in, in, 20, in, 20, in uh, 2001 in that square Tease 47. The main dog, Speed Letterman, came by with a bunch of Israeli guys. He was showing off. He said, he said uh, he's way up above me. He said, look, that is jelly. He the best peacocks man in all of Israel. Peacocks? What's a peacocks? <laughs> Pickaxe. <laughs> so I'm the best peacocks man in all of Israel. That's my, uh, that's my title. That's what I do. So I was hooked and uh, been going ever since. Uh, let's see, a baggy jug that was there. Let's see. There's a picture of the same one right there. Middle Bronze Age. You got your little chart. You can tell you how old that is. And then uh, slow mo. Uh, the last time we dug was 2019, and uh, we have the most architecture above ground in the 10th century in all of Israel. Our site is just chalk full of 10th century stuff. That's David. That's Israelite. Okay? And uh, we've got, we have found a Canaanite temple that dates to about 1375 A.D. And the reason we know of that precisely because Egypt ruled Palestine from 1300 <clears throat> down to about 1200, maybe 1400 to 1200. And we found a cartouche with the name of uh, Tutmos III. He ruled in 1375. So we know we're in that area. So this Canaanite temple is there. But 2019, we uh, are probably finished because this sweet guy, anybody watch the uh, TV show back in the 70s, I don't know, Welcome Back, Carter? Anybody ever see that? Does he not look like Horshack? Just a little bit. He even talked like him and he laughed like him. He died in 2020. Probably the best pottery man in all of Israel. That means we're finished because you cannot dig without somebody to tell you what the pottery is. You've got to read the pottery. You've got to know whether or not you've got pottery that comes from the 8th century, or is it from the 13th century? Where is it from? And if you can't tell that, then you can't tell when you're changing layers and going down to another civilization. Something else right quick. Somebody said, well, how's that thing build up? Well, most of the buildings were out of mud brick. This is mud brick. I've got a bigger one at home. I've got this one, the little one, because it's got a fingerprint in it. When we get finished, you want to come up here and rub your finger through a fingerprint that's 3,000 years old? You're welcome to. Just don't pick it up. That mud brick disintegrates, flattens out. People leave the site. It disintegrates. Fires, storms, wars flattens out. They just flatten it out and build on top of it again. And there you go. Layer, 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 layer. 8th century, we're down six or seven layers in the 13th century now, okay? We're not too far from bedrock, but the Canaanite temple is where we got to, and I don't know if we'll ever get to finish it or not. That may be some new PhD that gets to site someday. Right now, I think we're finished. I am not academically trained archaeologist, but I did work my way up from carrying buckets, pickaxing. I still pickaxe to, to a site supervisor, a square supervisor, 
And probably one of the sweetest things Dale ever said to me, he introduced me to a group of guys over there one day. He said, this is uh, my fellow archaeologist, Jerry Culbertson. I said, oh, wow. <laughs> but I'm uh, savvy enough to know that I'm not academically trained. I don't see what they see sometimes. But I can dig a square. I can tell you when we change layers. I can tell you what some of the pottery is. I can tell you not what not to do. So that was very uh, good for me. That's my background. So any questions before we move on to what is archaeology? Thought you might want to know some of that, see where I'm coming from. <coughs> Anything you want to ask? Okay. All right, when I say the word archaeology, what do you think of? Well, I know most of you think of Flinders Petrie, who established stratigraphy, right? Yeah, you do, don't you? You know Flinders, don't you? you used to be a friend of yours, right? Perfect. Yeah, perfect friend. How about William Foxwell Albright? No, here's who you think about. All right, let's get in the mood here. And there ain't no good self-respecting archaeologist that doesn't have one of these. Put that up on your desk right there. Whip and all. Dale Manor, the little fellow I was telling you about, he's a hoot. He's taking one of these little kits that got Indiana Jones, a whip, and all kinds of stuff, and he lays it, <laughs> he laid it out on a bunch of rocks over there in Israel and got a close-up camera. He's got pictures of, <laughs> it's funny as can be. But anyway, Indiana Jones is who most of you think about. You do not think of uh, some of these great archaeologists that I mentioned a moment ago. <clears throat> but as recent as 150 years ago, uh, archaeology was basically still treasure hunting. They wanted to find as much treasure as they could, as quick as they could, and they really were not all that concerned with where they found it in terms of on the site, uh, what it might have been used for, that type of thing. They were trying to get the treasures out as quickly as they could. <clears throat> um, if you remember the Ark of the, uh, remember the uh, Indiana Jones movie, the Ark of the Covenant was used to, the Germans wanted to get it to use God's power. Remember that? <clears throat> pretty warped uh, view of the Ark of the Covenant, I'd say. However, Israel did the same thing, did they not? How'd they lose it? They run it out in battle against the Philistines, thought they'd whoop up on them. Well, it didn't help. God let the Ark of the Covenant be taken in Philistine territory, ended up back at Bet Shemesh, where I dig. Okay, <clears throat> that's archaeology. What do you think about when you hear the word Bible? Well, there's a pl 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 plethora of things you could think about. Hopefully you'll think about God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, salvation, that type of thing, but it depends on who you're talking to, what they think about when they hear the word Bible. Archaeology, excuse me, is a compound word from the Greek, and it is the word archaeos, which you hear the English word archaic in there, and you hear the word logos, which you find in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, that type of thing. Uh, John used that for reasoning. He said to those a Gentile mindset in the book of John, I'm going to tell you what's behind this universe. You know there's something out there, and here's what it is. In 114, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So archaeology <clears throat> is also described as a science of rubbish. We deal with rubbish. We like rubbish. We like to dig in rubbish. <clears throat> in essence, archaeology is controlled destruction. That's right, I said destruction, not construction, although there is an element of construction when you reconstruct something. There are lots of places. Uh, one place is a wonderful site to visit if you're ever in Israel called Tel Bet Shon. Tel Bet Shon is a place where Saul and his uh, uh, son, were, the bodies were nailed to the wall over there at Bet Shon, just before the valley uh, there at uh, uh, Jordan River Valley. And uh, there, an earthquake knocked a lot of the stuff down and they're able to put it back up. Roman stuff, primarily Roman stuff, but it's a beautiful reconstruction. Most places in Israel are smart enough and good enough, Masada particularly, when they rebuilt something, they would put a black mark. You'll know above that is rebuilt, below it is original, okay? Now, when I say reconstruction, or when I say uh, destruction, oh, keep going that way. <clears throat> one thing is that... Uh, a lot of young guys that come over there and young ladies come over there, first thing, we get a jackhammer about every two weeks 
Uh, ours is a low budget dig. We don't have a lot of money, so we have to get it once a week and, and get rid of the big rocks that have accumulated. And uh, everybody wants to jackhammer for about two minutes. <laughs> and then when they all get their little tired, the rest of us who are, are workers, we have to do it the rest of the time. So one day we're jackhammering in that little square. Rocks are everywhere. And uh, I told Frank, Dr. Frank Wheeler, uh, chairman of the Bible department at York University, I've dug with him since 2004, uh, we had a taboon, which is an oven, in the corner of one of these squares, and alongside that taboon were rocks that were, were a table. They made their bread, they laid it on this table, made it out of rocks. So we're jackhammering these big rocks, and Frank said, well, why don't you just go ahead and jackhammer that table there? It's nothing to it. Well, that is a beautiful basin being held by Dr. Dale Manor. Here's that same basin that I jackhammered because it was turned upside down. And here it is right here if you want to see it later. Some of you guys are engineers, you can come put it together. I got part of it together. It cost me 100 bucks to get this thing home. It weighs about 100 pounds. And I, I really thought I was going to get chewed, but since it was not in situ, it was not where it originally was, it was a secondary use, I didn't get chewed out too bad. But let me tell you what, I never jackhammered another rock unless I turned it over. Matter of fact, just a few years later, one square over, same thing, turned over like that. I flipped it over, it was a basin. So you gotta be careful and make sure because once you destroy it, it's gone. And one of the, one of the toughest things for an archeologist, particularly Speed Letterman, some of these guys, they got all this beautiful stuff there, they don't wanna tear it down. We've got a, we had a beautiful, uh, oil press right on the edge of the Canaanite temple. I would dig it. He said, find the western wall. I found the western wall and would have found all of it, but he wouldn't let me get rid of the oil press. He said, I like it. I said, you may like it. How am I going to get the western wall? Because once you destroy that thing, it's gone. You can't make another one. So those are the tough decisions that have to be made <clears throat> by archaeologists. Uh, the modus operandi of most early archaeologists was to recover as many valuables as possible in the shortest amount of time, and again, with no regard for where it came from. <clears throat> Let's see, did I give you all those? Let's see, that's the basin. Okay, here's one of the scarabs. One of the things we find, that's the one I was talking about. It says to Tutmosis the third, that dates to about 1375. Archaeology today, modern archaeology, has gone way beyond what they used to do. We, and, uh, we, uh, we enlist the services of uh, zoologists, botanists, Egyptologists. They read that for us, told it what it means. None of us could read it. Uh, bones, we, we get hundreds of thousands of bones. And we send, used to send a, a lot of them to a guy at the University of Alabama. But I think he did them wrong one time. We quit him. But anyway, uh, later on when we talk about that shimish, maybe on that one I mentioned, I'll tell you about bones. I, I can show you in a level where we dig so far, ain't no pig bones. <laughs> Guess who was there? Israel. And then you start finding pig bones. Guess who's there? Philistine, Canaanites, that type of thing. So bones are very important. This is a diagnostic tool as well. Uh, modern archaeology, things have changed. We study building materials, mud brick, hewn rocks. Uh, that mud brick right here came from a what we believe was a building on the side of the tail, on the northern side of the tail, it begins to slant down, and uh, these mud bricks had fallen from up there. On the northern end of the tail, we believe a palace was built by a lady by the name of Nanir Makmish, and it was destroyed by fire. It fell over into the, into the uh, places where they had uh, 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 buildings that housed their materials, and it's there. And we took out over 900 of these mud bricks. Most of them burned. And uh, we laid them out, and then eventually you get some if you wanted. And so, Nanir Mukmish is another story. I'll tell you that later on. We believe she was the only Canaanite queen to ever rule in Israel, or Cana at that time. That's another story. But temples and buildings and palaces and olive presses and taboons. I've tore apart an olive press in 2016. We dissected it first, see what it looked like. Then we took it completely out. It's gone, but we've got many more to look at. Jewelry. Uh, children's toys, we find children's toys made out of, uh, <coughs> of uh, ceramics, weapons, sling stones, animal skins, canteens, scarabs, cartouches, clay figurines, beads, food. 
We found uh, some jars in that uh, warehouse where the brick fell on top of it. We found some, some grain from 3,000 years old. How about that? Still in that pot. Uh, pottery bowls, jugs, burial rituals. We have, uh, we have some um, tombs below on the west side of Tel Bet Shemesh. We explore those as well. In short, we're looking for anything that exhibits the presence or activity that man was there at one time. And then after we do that, we have to decide what was he doing there, who was there, what did he use this for, how did he do this. It's a, a process of interpretation. Um, passing through layer after layer of civilization, uh, again, the date of the pottery is the thing that tells you where you are. Uh, there's the Egyptian uh, scarab I mentioned. Here's another Egyptian. <clears throat> I remember this plane, it was 2007. I was standing pretty close to the girl who found it. She, she hollered, screamed like something. I thought a scorpion had bit her. Ah! <laughs> she come running out of there, and then she had this in her hand. This is a flat ceramic pottery figurine, half of it. And that top half, <clears throat> it's a pharaonic figure. Uh, you can see the pharaonic figure holding the lotus leaf. And then... Uh, speed came over as usual find me the other half and she did <laughs> two hours later that is very unusual very unusual two hours later she found the other half and there it is beautiful piece uh, down at the bottom you've got the pharaoh who is standing like a woman there was a, a pharaoh in Egypt her name was Hatshepsut and her brother didn't like her he tried to cover up everything she ever built and what he did was preserved it <laughs> Beautiful temple at uh, the Valley of the Kings, Hatshepsut's temple. And she dressed up as a pharaoh with a beard, but she stood like a woman. Same thing going here. That's, uh, that's the circumstantial evidence we have along with the palace and along with a lot of letters written to uh, the, the Egyptian uh, pharaoh from Tel Bet Shemesh asking for help. All of that is a smoking gun that our queen was named Nanar Makmush. And we think this is her a depiction of herself when she ruled Tel Bet Shemesh. Now, I say ruled and king, keep in mind in that day and time, Gezer had a king, Beersheba had a king, uh, Bet Shemesh had a king, Zora had a king, everybody had a king. Just like all these little towns right here got mayors, these were kings. But they were under Egyptian power, and when things went bad, they wrote to Egypt. And uh, this person wrote to Egypt and talked about every town within 20 miles around her and never mentioned her, Bet Shemesh, she didn't have to. That's who she's writing from. And she identified herself as a lioness. So we believe we have the only queen who ever ruled in Cana. Her name was Nanar Makmush. <clears throat> Again, you distinguish between pottery. In 2012, we found this Canaanite temple, the beginning of it. And all around one of the stones, which we thought at first were standing stones, turned out to be a sacrificial stone with a cut where the blood ran and the basin turned over, they caught it, and around it was all this pottery. This is Philistine pottery. It's decorated. Israel didn't decorate their pottery, so you need to know the difference between that as well. All right, here's some plain Israelite pottery. Top of a kind of a basin type thing or a jar. All right, <clears throat> now then, when we talk about, uh, I don't know how much time I got. What, what time is it? Well, I tell you what, you can leave when you want to. I'm going to go till I finish. You get tired and leave. I can't hold your attention. That's my problem. So leave when you want to. Anyway, <laughs> I don't mean to be rough. <laughs> uh, anyway, the uh, biblical archaeology. What is biblical archaeology? And again, uh, you have folks that uh, in the 1990s, and this is still a problem today, uh, back in the day with Albright and Flinders Petrie and these guys and the Exploration Society and all this good stuff, they sent archaeologists over there to do one thing, prove the Bible. Well, folks, that ain't what archaeology is for. And let me be the first to tell you, the Bible don't need proven by archaeology. It don't need it, okay? They're two separate disciplines, and they do two separate things. They both complement one another, though. And so we find here, excavating a site in the land known as the Holy Land during a period referred to as biblical text without at least some involvement of the Bible in a site without foundation. It doesn't have any soul. That's Amon Ben Tor, a famous archaeologist who dealt 
who dug at, um, hmm, forgot now, somewhere. That sore, I think. But anyway, <clears throat> so you got these archaeologists in the 1990s, and one of them was William Deaver, a big dog, a big American uh, dog, man. He, he was big. He wanted to change the name, and he did, to uh, Syro-Palestinian archaeology. Well, he changed it to that and then realized after a while he made a bad mistake. He wanted to go back to biblical archaeology, and so they've tried to do that. And the reason they did that was these young Israeli archaeologists said the Bible was leading the agenda instead of the other way around. And my contention is, I don't care which one leads it. Let each one do what it does. If the Bible has something to say about the archaeology, fine. If the archaeology has something to say about the Bible, that's fine too. If it doesn't, who cares? And so that's part of my thesis, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But anyway, that's uh, some of the stuff that's going on. Uh, one more PowerPoint or two, and I'll be through, actually. I mentioned to you earlier, stratigraphy. This is very, very important. This is uh, Ferris Austin, at one time was dean of students at uh, Faulkner University. Last two or three years he worked as their traveling guy who did uh, recruitment for master's programs. Uh, he was the best bucket man of all of Israel. I was the best peacocks man. He carried buckets. I mean, and you don't understand, when I go across a square 15 feet with a pickaxe, I'm steady. And I'm creating dirt. And these kids fall in behind me with an inverted hole, a big old hole called a terea. They put buckets between your feet. They're looking all the time. They're supposed to be anyway. Supposed to be looking because I might pop something up. I popped up a scarab one day, about like that, and this little girl said, how did you find that? I said, darling, I was looking for it. You're not looking for anything. Slow down. But I can create more dirt than they can handle. So they're carrying these, I guess they're five-pound buckets, duck dirt, and they're handed up to Ferris. He's carrying four at a time, sifting them and dumping them. That's why you get your dirt out of there. We have moved hundreds of thousands of dirt in 29 years. You wouldn't believe some of the piles we've created out there. We dumped it. I'd love to go through the piles someday because we only shifted every fifth bucket. No telling what's in there. Could be some diamonds. Who knows? Anyway, Ferris is standing in a place where you can see some beautiful stratigraphy. See those lines? That's a beautiful burn mark. See this wall right here, how tall it is? See how tall it is now? Same stratigraphy, we're working in there. This is where we first found in 2012, right there, we found these uh, stones. We thought they were pillar stones where you had a house. We thought we were in a house because we found some charcoal wood here that would have been perfect to have the, the lumber standing on it, making a house. That would have been cool. The only problem was, that more stratigraphy there, the only problem was that when we came back in 2014, I think it was, we didn't come in 13, uh, we found a third stone, and that wall was gone, and so we had a, a temple instead of a house. Now, here's my partner who comes with me sometimes. She usually comes the last week. That's old Kathy. She'll be mad because I showed these, but she's uh, digging in a square next to me. She's a good worker when you find her. She's hard to find. You see her? <laughs> she's a good worker, but you just got to find her. And then, you can't get her to work sometimes, she just plays all the time. Here she's reenacting something that happened in 2005, I think. We were way over limit. Sometimes we get checked by the IAA, Israeli Antiquities Authority, and if you've got a, a bulk wall you've created that's more than 8 feet, you're in trouble. Well, this bulk wall we had created was about 12 feet high. And you've got to know my Kathy. She's the, she's the most helpful person in all the world. She is helpful to the point I can't stand it sometimes. Leave me alone. Let me do it. You got a wife like that too? I see you smiling. It's a wonderful thing to have, but it's annoying. I can do some things. She came from the old school. Gets my tea and puts my shoes on. No, she doesn't do that. But she's helpful. But here I tried to tell her, be careful. Listen to what I'm telling you. So one day she's going to be helpful. She almost fell in that thing. I mean, she tripped and fell, and she had... It, it really funny once we saw she's okay. We're down 12 feet. We see her. She trips and falls. Went head first. Here's the 12-foot drop-off right there. Stuck her face in the, in the uh, sand, and she just put on sun, sunset lotion. <laughs> she came up. She looked like a raccoon. <laughs> and once we thought she was okay, we laughed. But she came. You can kill yourself. We had a guy break his back 
So anyway, she's helpful. But here she's reenacting that. <clears throat> she's standing on a stone that's very important to us. <clears throat> that's a filler stone in A22 where I worked a couple of years. That is the first stone that Slomo Munamovis, the fellow who died, and Spee Ledman ever found on that site. They walked the site. It hadn't, it hadn't been dug in years. They dug it in 31, 32, 1912, messed it up. But that was still standing up out of the ground. That's where they decided to dig. So that's a very important stone, very precious to us. So she's leaning on that stone. <clears throat> she finally found something. She was excited. Matter of fact, she is so excited, they let her keep it. This is a horn. <laughs> That's a horn she found. You want to come up and look at it, you're welcome to it. And then, again, you just can't keep her focused. So you got to wear the horn. I think this next one is what I want. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, maybe not. But anyway, let's see. Yeah. I've been going to Israel for 15 years and never seen a snake. First year she comes. Guess who runs across the snake? <laughs> Whole square is running out. What is going on? And that's a snake. I don't know if it's poisonous or not, but I didn't stick around to find out as well. So anyway, uh, she found a snake and that type of thing. She also found some sickle blades. <clears throat> Our Canadian buddies who work with us, they love flint more than life. If you find a piece of flint that's uh, that big, they can tell you if it's ever been worked on, if it's got any bubbles, they love it. They mark it, they draw it, they photograph it, everything. Here's a couple that we had so many of them, they let me keep two of them. That's a, that's a blade. That's a sharp sickle blade. There's two of them here. You're welcome to come up and look at them later on. <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this around. Just pass it around any way you want to. It's a jar handle. <clears throat> and uh, here's some little jar handles. Pass those around. <clears throat> That's from the 8th century BC. Doug goes up himself. I'll start these in the back. I found this rock one day and they didn't want it. I said, I like it. My bowling ball. I found that rock this young man back here has got. It's got to be used for something. They said it wasn't. I kept it. I don't know what it's used for, but it looks like it's used to me. Those are things that basically we find thousands of them. I bring 100 to 150 home usually, and I give them to kids. I'm about out now, but that's one that uh, you just throw it away. It has no diagnostic uh, sense to it. On the other hand, when you find these, you have handles, some bigger ones, you might later on, as you're digging and finding more pottery, be able to put something together this will fit with. So you keep this. This is diagnostic. And, of course, you keep this. <clears throat> I give you a jar handle like that. You guarantee I'll get this back, I'll send it around. If it doesn't come back, nobody leaves till I find it. That's got a thumbprint in it. The ideal is with the thumbprint as well as the finger mark up here on this one, if a craftsman at some point when he made 50 or 100 of them, he put his mark. He knew where he was. That's a diagnostic thing. We, we, uh, we, keep, uh, we keep those when we find them. So I'd like to have that one back for sure. All right, let's see what else we got here. Now, Kathy also, she's kind of a smart aleck. I said to her, Something, and she said, you want me to do what? <laughs> I like that. You want me to do what? I didn't really tell her anything. This is a pit. Sometimes you'll find uh, pits. Let's see, I got another. There you go. I'm going to stop with this one. But sometimes you'll find pits. I'll talk more about this pit later on. But they did just like we did when I was growing up in southeast Missouri. You probably grew up in a town like this if you're my age. And... Uh, Right now, still in Kennett, Missouri, they're 20 years behind time, maybe 100. When you come there at about 5 in the afternoon, it stinks. They're burning their garbage in, in cans still. They do that. Before cans, you buried it. These people did the same thing. So if you're in a square and you know you're in a certain century because of the pottery and all of a sudden you find pottery that doesn't belong there, it's because they dug a hole and buried their sand, buried their stuff in it. This is a pit right here, a pit. Happens to have bones in it. I'll tell you about those 
when we get to the Bet Shemesh part. So anyway, um, that's all I have for you tonight. If you've got any questions about general archaeology, I think I covered a lot of it. And uh, if I can answer any, fire away. If not, I look forward to October. If you have any questions you want me to deal with, let me know. I'll try to do that other than the three things that I've talked about. Thank you very much.